not being attached to outcome. Now, that's a tricky one to understand because a lot of, a lot of people, when, when they think about not being attached to outcome, they think it means, therefore, I'm not trying to have any particular outcome. You know, like I'm just, okay, whatever happens, happens, and I'm just completely passive. So that's one way to do it, and in fact, that's what we're practicing in a very pure kind of way with meditation, is that we're practicing just placing our awareness on the flow of the present moment without any sense of like where we're trying to get to. We're not focusing on the future at all. But with most things that we do, there is a focus on the future and there is a prefer there's an outcome that we're aiming toward. So what does it mean to not be attached to outcome if you are in fact intending an outcome? It just means that you're not emotionally clenching the outcome. That's all it means. So if I'm trying to get there by 9 a.m., I'm doing everything I can to get there by nine. I'm planning, I'm getting ready, I'm putting my shoes on at the right time, knowing how long it takes to tie my shoelaces, right? But then if something happens, you know, I'm about to walk out the door and the glass shatters on the floor and I can't leave the shattered glass all over the floor because someone will come home and step on it or because, or the traffic, you know, prevents me from getting there on time then rather than having this emotional conflict with what is, there's a, okay, this is how it is. So that's what it means, not be attached to outcome. It just means you're accepting things as they are, even though you have something that you're aiming for, right? So the second, so that's a, a, a passive quality, right? The active quality is you have some intention, but then, I'm, then around around that is a greater passivity. It's kind of helpful to see it in terms of what's on the outside and what's on the inside. Meaning that on the inside, the smaller thing is my will, my intention, but then there's something larger than the will, and that's your awareness of what's going on in the present moment. And I can be aware of my will, I can be aware of the traffic, I can be aware of the smashing glass, and accept all of that. That's, that's not being attached to outcome. And it's a passive thing. The second thing is not just accepting what happens in a passive way, but actively trusting that the way things actually are working out has some quality to it that is greater than whatever I think should be happening. Now, that's a hard one, because we, we see things in the world, obviously, that are not good, that we want to change, both on the personal level and the grand level. So what does it mean to trust that? Well, it's not an the, the point is it's not an intellectual assessment. Okay? Our intellectual assessment is, yes, we see these things that are not adequate, are not desirable, and so we can put our effort into changing those things. But at the same time, in a way that's kind of transcendent of intellect, we can simply make the choice to trust the way things are unfolding, to trust the way things are unfolding. If you intellectualize it too much, you mean I'm supposed to trust Hitler or that kind of thing? No, you can't, it doesn't work that way, right? Because if, if you do that, then you're just getting caught in an intellectual mess. What I'm talking about is very simple and very direct meaning like what's happening right now. The glass broke, the traffic, this person is in the hospital, you know, whatever it is that you're experiencing right now in this moment, you're trusting that this is the way it's unfolding, you're not going to apply your mind and emotions toward negatively judging what's happening, you're trusting it. You're making a decision, it's a decision to trust because if you don't make that decision to trust, then you're in conflict and you're generating negativity, which means you're actually putting more of that stuff into the world that, you, that we don't want, okay? So that's the quality of trust. The third quality, which is kind of connected to the first two, is this willingness to not know.
we don't know what's happening. We don't really know what's going to happen in the next moment, ever. We can be open to it. We can trust it. But in order to do those two things, we also have to really realize, like, and this is a, an intellectual uh, acknowledgement that we really, really don't know. There's something we do know, and there's something we don't know. What do we know? We know exactly what is in our experience right now. We know exactly what that is. We have absolute sureness. Everybody has the feeling of their body in the chair, right? You hear the sounds. You feel whatever you're feeling. Maybe you have an emotional feeling right now. Maybe you don't. There are thoughts popping into your head. You know exactly what you're experiencing right now for sure. And what's going to happen in a few minutes? You absolutely have no idea. You can make a guess. Hopefully, likely, you know, everything will go nice. We'll have a nice session together. But we don't really know what's going to happen. And so to really acknowledge that, you know, not just intellectually, but to let that knowledge really go into our guts, that we are living on the precipice of mystery constantly. So these three things are... are uh, hinted at so beautifully in the Parsha. I just wanted to take a little look at that. This, this Parsha is Beshalach, and Beshalach means sending. Means it says, Vayehi Beshalach Paro et Ha'am. When Pharaoh Shalach sent out the people, Volo Nacham Elohim Derech Eretz Pilishtim. This is a very uh, interesting construction of words. It says, Lo Nacham. Now, Nacham means, means comfort or soothing. But if you look in the English translation, it doesn't say that. It says, Elohim didn't lead them by the way of the Philistines or by the way of the land of the Philistines. So it's interesting, in the, in the Hebrew, we can see a connection between comfort and being led. You know, so think about that for a moment. If we're on the precipice of mystery, <laughs> if we don't know what's going to happen, There are potential dangers there. Should I go this way and avoid the danger? Or should I go that way? I really have no idea. And so there's a sense of comfort if I'm being led in a way that I am trusting, right? So there's that quality of trust about how I'm being led that creates a certain kind of comfort. And so in all the English translations that I've seen of this, it's always translated that Elohim, that the divine, is leading them. Right? But it doesn't, the word for leading is nacham, which means comfort. Ki karov hu, because it is close. Okay, so the, in other words, in the plain meaning of it, it's saying that uh, Hashem didn't lead them in the land of the Philistines because it would, even though it was close, like that would have been the closer, faster route to take. Why? Ki amar Elohim, because Hashem thought to itself, pen yenachem ha'am birotam milchama v'shavu mitzrayma. So, because Hashem is thinking to itself, Lest the people, and here's the word again, yinachem, comfort themselves. When they see war, when they see battle, and they return back to Egypt. But again, it doesn't translate this nacham, this, this word, as comfort. It, translated, it translates it as that they may have a change of heart. So, in other words, you could say they may choose to lead themselves back to slavery, back to Egypt, when they see a war. So, what is this saying on a, on a deeper level, on a symbolic level? Hashem is not leading them on the, the faster route. What is the faster route? The faster route means impatience. 
I want it to happen now. I want to get there fast. I can't be with it as it's unfolding. I want to, I'm pushing on it. And what is that? That's milchama. That's, um, that's conflict. That's being at war with what is. So what, is, what does Hashem do? Leads them on a, on a different way. On a different way. And then it says a little later on, the way that the people are being led is by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. By night. Right? So what is this pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire? Well, these are all symbols. So daytime means what we perceive, what we're aware of. So right now, in this moment, everything that we know for sure, everything we're aware of, that's what's represented by day. And what is represented by the cloud, right? The cloud means that which we can't see. That means the future. We can't see the future. And yet we're choosing to trust it. We're being led by the future. And we're treating this cloud, in other words, we're seeing that which we don't know as divine. We're seeing the mystery not just as this scary, dark mystery. We're seeing it as something that we're choosing to trust. Okay? And then let's flip it. Go to the nighttime. What does the nighttime represent? The darkness of night represents the represents that fear, that milchama, that constriction of ego, that lack of trust. And so what are we choosing to follow? We're choosing to follow the burning fire, the light. What is the light? The light is the knowledge that we have the power to trust, that we have the power to open to what is unfolding. <clears throat> 